Hello, I'm Martin Beaver. I'm a violin and chamber music professor at the Colburn School in Los Angeles. I'm a former first violinist of the Tokyo String Quartet and current violinist of the Montrose Trio. And I'm Kevin Fitzgerald. I'm a pianist. Uh, I teach at USC Thornton School of Music and I teach uh, solo piano and collaborative arts. Uh, so doing both chamber music and solo, which is also what I do all the time as a performer. And we're delighted to be talking to you today about Beethoven's Sonata Opus 12, number one, in D major. In 1990, when I participated in the Indianapolis competition, uh, I won the special Beethoven Prize with this piece, uh, in large part, I'm sure, due to uh, all the performances that Kevin and I had under our belts. So um, we're very, very happy to be talking to you today. This sonata was composed in 1798 and dedicated to Antonio Salieri. Those of you who have seen the movie Amadeus will know that name very well. It's in three movements, an allegro con brio, a tema con variazioni, which very much mirrors uh, the andante con variazioni of the sonata number nine. Uh, there will be more about that later. Uh, the third movement is a rondo allegro. This is the first of Beethoven's 10 piano and violin sonatas. And uh, it exhibits, uh, I would say, a classic feel of his, his early period writing. Very, very bright, very um, uh, sunny, mostly. And um, it's, it's a very fresh feel. It's interesting to note that actually um, Salieri, the, the reason Beethoven knew him was because he actually coached language with him. He wanted to learn Italian so that he could learn to better set Italian songs, which was actually something he was writing quite a bit of at the time. And uh, so it's, it's really odd in a way that he did dedicate these sonatas to him because it wasn't really for a musical homage, really. It was more of a a thankfulness for his teaching and his coaching in Italian. So how do we approach starting the sonata? We have an allegro con brio uh, in common time, 4-4 four, four time, so four beats to the bar. What I have found uh, is a big challenge is keeping those four beats to the bar while making sure that the flow of this allegro isn't too plotty and that you can really get a sense of, of the brio. Also, uh, a particular challenge, which I think would be worth going over right away, is actually how to, to start in terms of cueing and, and communicating between the piano and the violin to get these, uh, um, this, this very sort of heroic opening going. So we will we'll start perhaps by a, a little demonstration. wasn't beginner's luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so uh, a couple of elements to think about, certainly from the violin perspective here. Um, we have a dotted half note on that first chord. Uh, what I like to do, uh, and normally, of course, uh, I would be standing uh, a little bit more side by side with, with Kevin, so he would be able to, to see my movements uh, from, from the side. But um, what I like to do is give a very dynamic finish to the note. So, so the takeaway from the note actually is the fourth beat of the bar. And that gives Kevin or any pianist um, a good idea of the tempo. Simply because when you play, it's very hard to discern a, a noticeable tempo. Right. Yeah? And then, of course, it is very important here uh, both for the character, uh, but I I indeed just for the general clarity, to get a, a very, very good clear beginning to these slurs. And however one approaches the string, there is a point where the bow will, even for a millisecond, be at rest on the string. So you get a very, very clear be beginning. And I like to come off the string on each stroke and then to reapply the bow, as it were.
and I would say in the third bar, uh, again, back to the cueing. I would just cue that last quarter note, and that seems to be quite clear for, for the pianist, although you might want to chime in. <laughs> well, well what's, in what's very interesting is from the perspe uh, pianist's perspective is that uh, exactly everything that Martin's saying is exactly what we actually need to do, too. We need to think about the full value of the note. In, these, in those figures, we need to articulate a little bit more. Um, it, it's still basically connected. We're slurred, but there needs to be an articulation there that matches what the violin is doing. You can't, uh, you can't go in the opposite direction of what your partner is actually doing. And in terms of counting and release, of course, we need to feel that exactly with each other, including at the beginning. You know, you have to make sure that you, even though there's a cue at the beginning from the violinist, you need to feel the breath and the preparation before that even happens as well. Yes, and certainly rehearsing helps too. <laughs> <laughs> Repeated practice will, will, will generally up your batting average there. Yeah. Well, the fun thing, of course, with this is that you can rehearse it and be really professional at this, and it still won't be together sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> there is a little bit of luck involved, for sure. <laughs> and of course, also, I, I would say, uh, bearing in mind not only this opening, but just the, uh, the piece in general and Beethoven's musical language, uh, we of course have to be very, very mindful of uh, subito changes of, of dynamics, so sudden changes from forte to piano or vice versa. And of course, uh, I think this also implies uh, sudden changes of mood. This first phrase after this, this sort of fanfare, this, this um, kind of majestic opening, we then get um, a very, very lyrical phrase with, with very lyrical eighth notes underneath it. So as you see, there's a very, very quick change there. Um, in the violin part, certainly here, I find that it's important, although in a very, very lyrical way, it's important to preserve the value of the, the double dots and the 16th note. One often hears uh, errors uh, on the side of sounding almost like a triplet, like so. Or simply an eighth note. So one exercise uh, th that you can use to develop the sense of what the 16th really should be is actually to, to play the whole passage uh, in 16th notes. You can, of course, start slowly. But that'll give you a real idea of, of how late in the bar the 16th needs to fall, yeah? But again, one has to, to balance that with the, the need to be nice and lyrical. Um, shall we try it from measure five? Yeah. Another important part about this phrase, besides the accuracy of the rhythm against the piano part, which is straight eights is also that both the violin and the piano don't crescendo too soon. Generally, people will start this phrase and start opening up right away. And the crescendo is actually written in measure nine, is it? Six, Correct. seven, eight, nine, measure nine. And uh, so that's still actually your softest point. So you want to hold back a little bit so that you blossom and then have your subito piano in measure 12.
You may have noticed at the end of that phrase, when the crescendo did start, both Kevin and I kept the crescendo going absolutely till, till the very last instant before the piano. And that again is very, very typical of, of Beethoven's writing.